You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law, and with me, actually with me, but more than six feet apart away from me, is my co-hostess with the mostest, Paul Doroshenko. It's about two meters. Nice to see you. Yeah, we First we time basically I've measured. actually seen you. We did like the Bonnie Henry, Adrian Dix thing. Yeah. The Sistine Chapel thing. Oh, well, I've got the mic set far enough apart. Yep. Yep. We, we predicted the pandemic and constructed the studio. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's always been designed so we could be a little ways away from each other, but... This is further now, I'm just but glad. you're supposed to not be, um, no longer be shedding the virus theoretically. No. So no, no longer shedding the virus and, and uh, immune from other people <clears throat> giving it to me. And I would assume that I'm probably immune because I've had contact with nobody, basically physical contact, except my kids at home, my family, and the, um, that's like 20 whatever days. And me beforehand. So you think that. Yeah. I still think I had it. I will never know. Well, we will one day know. There's serology tests that coming. They, I don't think they're going to rush to do that. They'll have a vaccine before they'll have serology tests. They have them used. in the U.S. already. Do they? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well. So they're, they've been approved by the FDA um, and they're going to be here shortly. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I will be able to find out. But apparently there's also people who have had it and have very little immunity developed. Yes. And I'm so, hoping I'm not one of those people because right now I'm like, woo, I'm the king of the world. I can go out and I can touch the things. I can like toilet seats. Yuck. I don't know. What, what I, that's what the kids were doing and all these kids that got coronavirus because they know, were acting I like know, assholes. I know, I know, I know. Did you read about the uh, judge who died who didn't want his courtroom to stop? I mean, look, I never want to be happy when somebody dies and I never want to say that they deserved it, but... No, he this didn't, he didn't deserve it. He just, no, it's not. It's a, he made a mistake. It was a foolish mistake. Uh, people should have been better informed about it. Courthouses continue through a lots of, through yeah, lots of different things. He was insisting that bullshit, like nonsensical, not urgent matters move forward. No, I know. And it's, it's a failure though of the court to come up with a policy. It wasn't, it's not up to him to come up with a policy in his courtroom. It's up oh, for the courthouses. It is. Is Judicial it? independence. That's right. true too. Yeah. You, know, well, you anyway. could have any any judge could say, hey, you know, we're going to come up with uh, with a policy of our own because I'm a judge and I'm independent and the court can make its policies, but they don't bind me. And I'm going to declare that all matters scheduled in front of me go ahead, urgent or not. Well, that's what he did. And now two weeks later, he's uh, deceased. So, yeah, and that's sad, but it's not as sad as it could be. Well, apparently he was a well-liked judge and he'd been on the bench for since 2004 at least. You know who did die? Who? Richard, not Richard Corey. Sorry, that's a Simon and Garfunkel song. <laughs> Justice Corey. Oh. Yes. Yes, Maybe. they announced his death uh, today, which is Thursday um, the 9th. Uh, yeah, he passed away. 92. Oh, okay. Yep. But not from... They didn't say. I would imagine at 92... Probably not from coronavirus. Might have been in a senior's home or something at that point. Might have been. Um, but at 92, you know, lived a good life, spent a decade on the Supreme Court of Canada. Wrote some... Peter Corey? Yeah. 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 I was going to write like a parody of Richard Corey. You know, they say that Peter Corey was one hell of a good judge. Seemed like a good judge, but I look back and they all seem so conservative to me. I don't know. No, because like there were like the, like the Lemaire days, lots of Brian good... Dixon, Bore Alaska yeah. and uh, Tony Lemaire. They were all pretty good, but fish, fish was always good for the charter. Well, yeah, but that was a short period of time. Yeah. Golden, golden yeah. days. Yep. Yeah. Old white guys. Anyway, we have lots to talk about and not, uh, you know, I haven't been hosting this podcast for the last basically three weeks. You've been stepping into the hosting role. I know. Do I should get some sort of reward? What, what do you should want? Should have had a beer, cold beer ready for me here or something. Yeah. You, you want me to go get, get you a beer, put my hands all over it. 
I'm safe. I think I had it. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not coughing. Like I'm not shedding virus because I'm not doing any of the things that the virus makes you do. Well, there you go. There's no droplets. Plus I'm wearing my N95 mask and my gown and <laughs> hat and my gloves. So I'm pretty safe too. So and you I'm have two an meters away. N95 mask and you're not giving it to a healthcare professional? I just have one. I've had it for the last six years. Right. Okay. So speaking of the pandemic, because that's all anybody's talking about, I know that you talked to Eric McGracken and I know that you, um, and I talked a little bit about ICBC the last time I talked to you, which was right after my diagnosis, basically. Um, but everything's changed for ICBC as a result of the coronavirus. Everything's changed. They've moved to online and over the phone insurance renewals and license renewals, mm -hmm. which you're kind of like, why did this just become a thing now? Yeah. Like, I don't get it. It saves... Not only does it save time, but as I'm building up to something here, Paul, not only does it save time for people who don't have to go and wait around at ICBC or an insurance office, it saves money. You know how many fewer people ICBC has to employ if people are doing it online? Oh, for sure. No doubt. Which makes me think, you know, all those costs at ICBC that are blamed on the personal injury lawyers... What about just a really poorly run system that didn't account for the ability of people to do on things online and, and thereby save money? Well, I've been talking to people who are part of the justice system who have been saying for years I wanted to see them do this, 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 and this. But there were so many people saying no and but and well, yeah, but you can't do it because of this. And there's always the, the naysayers. Uh, and now these things are being done rapidly mm -hmm. because they have no choice and the naysayers are being just disregarded and you know they're figuring out a way to do it yeah. and that's what they're doing at ICBC right now too thank goodness that's the way it should be yeah and hopefully this online insurance and license renewal and over the phone insurance and license renewals sticks around yeah well if they come up with some other method the only thing is they have to take your photo yeah but you could submit a photo. I know. And they have already your photo in their photo recognition system. So if you submitted a photo of someone that wasn't you, they would know. No, I know. And then they could call you, send you a text to your phone, no, they're texting not, you that you have to come in. They're not going to call you. And they're not going to send you a text. They're going to get an investigator to call you. But yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> but I mean, they might just call you and say, this doesn't look quite nice enough. But yeah, the chances are if it was, if it looked like you were trying to commit a fraud, yes, it would be an investigator calling you. The, the vast majority of people now have a camera on their smartphone that's excellent, that takes high definition, good quality photos. Yeah, but everybody would be like face adjusting their photo before they sent it in. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna uh, face tune myself. I'd put a, I'd yeah. put a bunch of filters on myself to make myself look five years younger. Yeah, but you yeah, know. I'd look like the, I was 35 by instead By the time of, they squish it down and make it black and white and pixelate it for the license, you don't look good no matter what. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a possibility. I think they should do it. I think they can do it. And I think that they should keep it. Well, we'll see how much money they save. I mean, the thing about ICBC, I mean, the government, um, so the Alberta government has laid people off during this. Uh, the provincial government in BC has not laid people off. Uh, there's nobody, you know, driving around in parks this weekend because they're, all the parks are closed. The, um, the and there's a lot of people parks, who are yeah. probably not, wor yeah, there's a lot of people who are probably not working for the provincial government. There's a lot of people who are working really hard in other in other departments, I noticed in the uh, parking lot next to our office in Richmond that it is often filled with cars for government workers. I'm mm -hmm. assuming that they've taken steps in their offices to protect themselves and to be safe. But the Ministry of Children and Family is dealing with lots of cases where kids are at home um, and trying to figure out how, how to deal with that. Um, however, they haven't laid people off and they don't get a federal government rebate. Mm -hmm. ICBC is probably not looking at laying people off because they're trying to keep people employed to stabilize the economy. Um, so we may not save any money. We may not see the, realize the savings here. Well, here's where I think we will realize the savings. Today was my very first day driving yeah. since 
all of this. And I left my house at 4.45. I drove down 49th Avenue and then to Knight Street to get to Richmond. And ordinarily, if you were to leave at 4.45 and take 49th Avenue or Knight Street, you would have a lot of problems with, you know, bumper to bumper traffic. It not uncommon to take 45 minutes to get from my house to Richmond at that time of day. Oh yeah, for sure. And I There's was nobody able, on the road. I was able to stop, get my dog's medicine and stop at McDonald's and fulfill my, you know, three week long craving and get here in half an hour. Yep. Which is crazy to me. Um, so nobody on the road, nobody on the road at peak traffic times where we see, you know, how many days a people, week? People still driving badly though. Yeah. On my trip here, there was. <laughs> but you're not seeing the accidents that we see before. And how many days a week do we hear, oh, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, a fender bender in the Massey Tunnel and there's a, you know, there's an accident on the Arthur Lang Bridge and, you know, multiple accidents during commute time. And if you're listening to the radio after Bonnie Henry's reports and in the morning, um, there's no, there's no traffic problems. There's no accidents. Well, there's been some, just not nearly as much, but no. yes, they certainly down and the severity of the accidents, the accidents that you can pretty much predict there's going to be an accident at this intersection every third day, yeah. those are gone. And so ICBC is not going to have much, but of course all those body shops too are not going to have any work. <laughs> um, but ICBC doesn't pay the body shops if they're not doing work. No, I know. But the body shops are also going to end up laying people off as a consequence. It's going to be, it's going to damage the economy that there's not the accidents. Right. But my, my, my point isn't about the economy, although here's driving law affecting the economy, I guess, to some extent. I mean, if you throw driving law into a pandemic, but, um, but you have, uh, you have the the fact that there's no accidents saving all of that money that ICBC hang out for claims, you know, the, the, you know, one supercar that gets smashed up a week in Vancouver, that ain't happening. No. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. They're, um, the $13 million a day that they were bleeding. I'm sure they're not bleeding anything right now. <laughs> and there's no litigation costs right now because nothing's going to court because none of the ICBC personal injury matters are considered urgent. So you have no applications taking place in court, no chambers applications, no um, no applications for discovery, no uh, appointments for examination. Um, you have no uh, no trials. There's, All of their there's no way they're paying any overtime for anybody at any ICBC office. No, and I bet a ton of the uh, a, a ton of the ICBC defense bar are laid off, not officially, but they're not getting any files from ICBC. Yep. So they're not paying those lawyers right now. So they're saving tons of costs, not just in not paying out claims because there's no claims, but also in not litigating anything. Well, and you remember that, that this is, you know, all of those people working at home, this is going to last for a while. Mm -hmm. ICBC's dumpster fire is over. Yeah. This is the point. Look, and, and, and we all know, because I've been getting emails from prosecutors and I've been sending emails to prosecutors and you've been in the same boat right now, everybody's got to take a long, hard look at their files and go, does this really need to go back into court when we, you know, have normalcy again? Can't we settle this out now? Yeah. With the objectivity of living under a pan, uh, pandemic. Which has been. Pandemonium. And this is, you know, another thing, this, this is given like this surprising amount of civility to the bar. No, I noticed. Yeah. I noticed that too. People are, are being a, a lot more reasonable in their view of things. Yeah. Um, you know, let's resolve this. Life is too short to argue over this petty little thing. Yeah. You know, for my clients, a lot of the time, the driving prohibition is the sticking point for them. And now the prosecutors are like, oh yeah, well, you know, we don't want to put them on public transit. Yeah. Well, they're not going to be driving much anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> what risk are they really going to pose? They're at home most of the time. So I don't know. I think, you know, this could be an opportunity if you're listening, David Eby. Um, this could be an opportunity to walk back some of that legislation that is currently sitting that would 
prohibit people from litigating their ICBC claims in court, the, the no-fault legislation. And revisit some of the expenses that ICBC is paying and some of their methods that mm-hmm. have uh, cost them money over the years. Maybe we can all take a moment of somber reflection, personal injury, plaintiff bar and defense bar and ICBC, and go, there's a way that we can save a lot of money and we don't lose the right to go to court. And we've just had this, you know, 12 week, I guess it'll end up being period of cost savings to reset the expense clock. Well, it'll be more than 12 12 weeks. Well, uh, I'm I'm hopeful that it'll be shorter than that, but I think you're right. Um, The other thing is the legislation that's currently sitting prevents them from raiding ICBC's coffers. So if they're true to their word about, you know, preventing governments from doing that, and they, when the legislature resumes again, pass at least that portion of it, that would allow them then to um, use the cost savings truly for the reset on ICBC and not to make up all the money they're spending, you know, paying for this. Yeah. This pandemic thing. Yep. Well, that's the thing, actually. So I think they were about to pass legislation saying that ICBC could never be raided for the purpose of provincial coffers. Um, <laughs> now we need to pay portions of people's salaries. And uh, what was off the record last week when I was speaking with Eric McGracken was we were talking about. If the, it's off the record, why are you putting it on the record? Was uh, it was before the record? Okay. Was that uh, generally speaking, you know, we recognize the need and desire of the government to do everything it can, and it seems the steps they were taking were are pretty rational to you know keep people employed and so forth and try and keep the stabilize the economy. The problem, of course, is that we're going to be paying for it for a long time, probably a, a decade and a half. Everybody says basically my generation is going to shoulder the cost of this. Well, it's actually just slightly under your generation that's going to be fine. So we're going to have the lost decade now. So between your your generation and my generation, um, the people who are um, still in the working world and have to work more for retirement, we are going to have a declining economy. Uh, and increase taxes for the next 15 years and the people, well, you, you are sort of are the cutoff. I think you will still have the time, but if you're just a year or two older than you, you look at the, when the next sort of boom will come along. And I think it could be, you're, you're, you'd just be getting to the end. So you'll be, you plan on working till you're 80. Having Um, COVID-19 is probably going to have decreased my lifespan. Because Maybe. of the permanent damage it apparently does to your lungs. Well, only to 30% of the population. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you might be fine. Uh, you were never on a ventilator, so I think it's the people who got to the point where they had to be on a ventilator that, who right. are the ones who are facing the permanent lung damage. But um, yeah, it's the uh, generation right after you are going to enjoy the historic boom um, that will come soon to be historic boom. Sweet. Well, but you'll still be working, so it's fine. So long as you want to work from the ages of uh, solid from 55 to 80, you'll be fine. It's the next 20 years that are going to suck, the next 15 years. Well, you know, there's there's definitely no boom right now, because the other thing I want to talk about <coughs> with you briefly is drug driving. Mm-hmm. Everybody's all like, oh, you know, we can't figure out a way to make people not drink and drive. Apparently, the answer is close all the bars and restaurants and order people to stay in their homes. Well, alcohol sales are up. There alcohol are st- sales there, and consumption are there up There is still still some drinking and driving. Um, you know that is drinking and driving is what pays our our rent. Um, and <laughs> it pays for my entire existence. Yeah. Um, there is still some. Certainly not what there was. And uh, without the bars and the uh, and hockey. Uh, um, um, Stanley no Cup sports. playoffs. No sports. Um, there's just not nearly as much alcohol consumption and not driving. And that's great, you know, for society. Um, there's also really a problem with enforcement. Um, and if you're a police officer right now, you probably are not overly enthusiastic about pulling somebody over. And you talked about those issues in the last two Yeah, podcasts. and I gave a interview to Global on Tuesday and laid it out. So let's see, what was it, about 
12 days ago, I put some videos up about cleaning ASDs and safer breath testing. You can find them on the Acumen <clears throat> Law YouTube channel. And I put those up specifically just to let everybody know that they need to consider those things and for them to turn their mind to it. I didn't want to, to lay out exactly where that was headed at the time. Because where it's really headed is that you can't safely take tests with an AlcoSensor FST um, mm -hmm. because it's unsafe for the officer and it's unsafe for the user because despite the fact that you have a new s sanitary mouthpiece on it, you can uh, end up with uh, inhaling pathogens from it. Right. But still, the rates of people who are out there on the road um, driving their vehicles under the influence of alcohol is lower because you have fewer people who get in their vehicle before drinking than drink than have to get home. Yeah, it's probably 10 to 15% of what it normally would be. And that's very interesting because I don't know, you know, we, we That's pandemic about, savings for the government. It is. It is pandemic savings because they're saving money on enforcement. They're saving money on the costs associated with drunk driving accidents where people are injured or where there's damage to property. Prosecution. Um, prosecution of these cases, the matters going through court, all of that. Yeah, it's, it's more, you know, it's more savings. You know, we talk about all these big expenses in um, paying for things that we have to pay for to help people out who are suffering as a result of this. But, you know, driving law has given us a bunch of savings. There you go. Just fewer people on the road. You're just talking about the cost of driving. So this is feeding right into the cyclist lobby. Well, the, the but removing people from the road is never, ever ever going to happen as a long-term thing. This is not something that's going to last. Like it's not going to be after the pandemic. Well, we're going to keep bars and restaurants closed and keep people off the road and keep Stanley Park closed to vehicle traffic. Did you see the uh, the thing about the, the danger of cyclists with COVID and how they're, um, they're no. broadcasting their, uh, their, the virus, shedding the virus back behind them for like seven to 20, <laughs> 20 meters? <laughs> and how dangerous it is to ride past, have them ride past you because they're sweating and they're basically spraying it away from their body. Well, that's, <laughs> that is an interesting thing because that's actually anti the cyclist being like, oh, it's so much better for everybody and so much healthier. If you're sick and you're cycling, we're not just talking about spreading COVID. Anytime you're sick, that's how far all of your droplets are going. Yeah, I know. I know they've, they're actually studying that now and we're discovering it and it's a, a kind of disturbing. They should mandate face masks for cyclists. Um, I wouldn't say that, but, um, I would think that, um, the, um, maybe there should be, um, separate cycling tubes underground. <laughs> underground cycling tubes. That's hilarious. Yeah. But Tunnels. Yeah, something. something like that. Um, Anyway, so yeah, impaired driving is down, but do you know what is up consistently across basically all of North America, even with the pandemic? Non-driving related? No, driving related. Driving related. This is the Driving Law Podcast, yes. Paul. The driving related thing is people speeding. Yeah, speeding is like hugely on the rise. But there's a big question there as to whether or not it's actually on the rise or it just happens to be there's the only car down the, on the road. Um, you know, if you're going 20 kilometers an hour over the speed limit in Vancouver, you're driving with traffic most of the time. Like that's yeah. just the way it is. But if you're going 20 kilometers an hour down the road in Vancouver right now, you're the only car on the road and you're easy to get with a laser device or a radar device. Um, you're, you're much more likely to be pulled over in those circumstances. So you think it's an issue of the enforcement being more strict right now? Ease of enforcement? Enforcement being more strict that, and that you're parked be. in your cruiser and you're not going to be setting up a roadblock and you're probably not doing a, you know, driving around, you're not driving around parking lots of bars. So you're there ready to do speed enforcement. Well, I'll tell you my theory. Your theory that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Damn, here's mine. It's a damn good theory. It is a damn good theory. We'll see whether or not I yours is so often, good. You know, they've been talking a lot about stress and the way that people are stressed right now because they've been losing their jobs. They're, they might not be bringing in as much work as normal if they're a business owner. Ahem, me, um, you, um, you know, they have uh, health concerns. They've got children. that They've got to do homeschooling. They've got, you know, none of their leisure activities available to them. They're all these sources of stress. Everybody knows. Um, and... 
One of the things that you see commonly when people are speeding is that they're often speeding because they're trying to, you know. They need to get somewhere get, fast. It's not. But it's also they're trying to and they're let stressed. loose. Yeah. You know. Well, sometimes it's a it's, stress relief, but sometimes they need release. to get somewhere fast. You know, that's why they're speeding. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was this case, it was in my Weird and Wacky Wednesday blog post of the guy in Australia who got in his Lamborghini and was speeding and driving really fast. And he was pulled over and he said, I need to go to the hospital because I think I have COVID-19. I'm trying to get there as fast as I can to get a test. I'm sure that logic in his mind somehow worked. But it probably, you know what? I Yeah, I'm sure that logic in a lot of people's minds does work because... We're told, you know, this is a deadly virus and it can kill you. And it is horrible to have it, speaking from a first-hand experience. I can see how you'd get scared. And if I'd gotten in my car and had to go somewhere when I was like that, I probably would have driven really fast. Because I wasn't sure when I was walking around my house that I'd live. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing is there's um, some of the asymptomatic stuff are confusion. Uh, and dizziness, and so you might not be thinking clearly. Um, I think the other thing, though, is that people see the open road and uh, assume that there's no police there because the police probably all are on some sort of COVID shifts um, dealing with domestic assaults. Yep. And so they see the open road and they think, well, this is my opportunity. I've had this 486 horsepower car for the last 18 months <laughs> and I after buying it I realized I'm only allowed to go lawfully up to 120 kilometers an hour and I pushed it up to 130 once well this is my opportunity to you know get it to 160 which is still only a third of its speed range yeah sure okay so three good theories one people are being subject to greater enforcement two people are using their driving as a stress release and three as usual, some people are assholes. I don't know that they're being assholes. They're actually being quite safe. They're looking at the road conditions and saying, look, there's nobody on the road. This is my time to safely wind it this up. This is they're my just, time to deliberately the violate the law. Well, that's the diff that's a different thing. I mean, does it make them an asshole? I don't know. Maybe well, it does. Okay. You decide. <laughs> if that's the case, <laughs> I'm then... I'm the arbiter of asshattery? <laughs> well, if you're the... Uh, <laughs> Um, Excellent. <laughs> if you are the, uh, I've been trading for this role my whole hang life. On. You've defended, you've defended hundreds of speeding tickets, hundreds of thousands, them. thousands of them. Um, I don't want you to pass judgment on your clients, Kyla. I don't. I actually don't. I know. So most of the time, I really do not care. Um, you could phone me and be like, "Yeah, I was going two seventy three in an eighty zone," and I'd be like, "Well." You don't have the record yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's going to be a tough one to defend. There's an interesting thing about innocent until proven guilty. You are still considered innocent right now. Yeah, exactly. Hence why I don't pass judgment. Maybe exactly. they weren't doing 273. I know. Maybe their speedometer was busted. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that, I guess, brings us to the Ridiculous Driver of the Week. The Ridiculous Driver of the Week. This is a really short podcast. Is it? Yeah, we're like half an hour in, but that's okay. It's a pandemic. Well, I'm sure I can come up with another topic after the Ridiculous Driver of the Week if you really want. If you want. But I liked this. You found this ridiculous driver of the week. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Well, I, I, actually, I, I don't want to be the one who tells you about it. I did find it, but I, I'm already sort of a little bit tired about it. Okay. Well, uh, this ridiculous driver of the week. Is his name Chen? Um, ben. Ben Chen. Ben something. Ben Gold. Ben. I think it's Ben Chen. Ben Chen. Yeah, Ben Chen. I like the rhyme. <laughs> that adds to the ridiculousness. Ben Chen. Uh, is a supercar collector, co-owner of something called Gold Rush Rally, which maybe some of our listeners will know what that is. I don't know what it is. I'm assuming it's a video game or something. I, I assumed it was like some type of Apple. car company, car collecting service. I, I have no idea. Anyway. No idea. Um, he was uh, charged with reckless driving and impaired driving, impaired by drugs, after he went on a five-car 
hit and run spree in Manhattan. Like, okay. Because the road sure. is open. Yeah, the road's open in Manhattan. And also, you know, there's definitely a hospital bed for you <laughs> if mm. you fuck some shit up. <laughs> um, yeah, oh my gosh. And while doing it was driving his Gambala turned Porsche Carrera GT. Now you... Tuned, yes. It's a Porsche Carrera Thank that's you. been been tuned and made faster and lower and sportier to make it look like a Ferrari or something. But Apparently anyway. it's like $800,000. Yeah. Which is st- Silly. stupid. <laughs> um, so that... Uh, is is hilarious on its own that you would just like drive like a maniac and smash up your almost a million dollar million bucks after tax car. It only driven a few blocks too. Well, that's why you don't drive after doing drugs, I guess. Yeah. Um, but the, the even, story develops. Yes, <laughs> the even more ridiculous part about your hit and run spree and your million dollar car is that this is. Not the first time that Ben Chen has been involved in such a situation. Not the second time or the third time. Yeah. It's many times and a bunch of, of other times that are suspected that people are writing in about that, yeah. that didn't make the news. Yeah. There's pictures in this article. It's on thedrive.com and there are pictures of numerous, very expensive looking cars that are... He like launched a McLaren off a, off a highway and landed in a storage yep. locker. Uh, and then there was some Mercedes that he just scraped really badly against the ground. And then there was another a Lamborghini, I think. Uh, and then there are reports of others where there wasn't necessarily photographs, but there are reliable witness statements of other times that he's destroyed these cars. And one wonders about his insurance premiums and whether or not they put that together. But, in, but one of them was a rental car. Yeah. Well, why not, right? Yeah. If you're going to rent a car, drive it like you stole it. If yeah. If you're going to drive it like you stole it, make I, sure it's a, a McLaren, what is it, an M12 or something? 12C Spider? Probably the first, like, two times I rented a car in my early 20s, I drove them hard. Then after that, I was like, oh, it's just a car. And now I'm probably the gentlest rental car driver there is in the world. I know. When I get in a rental car, I'm like, I don't know if I know how to drive anymore. I've forgotten. I better go very slow. <laughs> yeah. Slowly. Um, yeah. Me in a rental car is not a good thing. I hate, I hate rental cars. Um, but yeah. So there you go. Oh, actually, you know what? There was one more thing that we needed to talk about in the Driving Law podcast. Which is? Which is the extension of limitation periods in British Columbia. Yeah. That is certainly worth discussing. So this was, uh, of course, an emergency situation. The government's declared an emergency, which gives them all sorts of power to make declarations. And um, the uh, uh, basically by regulation, I don't even know how they're signed off on or if they're just a pure declaration of the Solicitor General. It's an or... emergency order made by David Eby. Yeah. Um, well, it, I think more than one minister can do it. Yeah, but it was him that yeah. did it. So the emergency order by David Eby was extending limitation periods for certain things and not just like completely, but... Yeah. Um, for example, things construction that... law disputes. Except for? Yeah. You you still have to file in time for a construction law or builder's lien. Well, that's because all the construction sites are still going. Yeah. Um, and because there's like economic, significant economic impact if you do it much later. Yeah. But... One thing that he did extend, uh, not extend, one thing that he did, a power that he conferred, was to give administrative tribunals that have their own limitation periods, either internally or by statutes, the discretion to extend them. So he didn't say they're automatically extended. He said the tribunal has the discretion to extend a limitation period. Now, do they have to do it as a policy or does it have to be uh, on an individual basis? That was my question. Uh, it would... Like, does the tribunal have to say, we're, instead of accepting no, I... applications within seven days, we're going to accept them within 21? Or does it, you have to apply? No, because it's discretionary. Um, if they were to make a policy that said, in all circumstances, this is what we would do, that would be an unlawful fettering of discretion. So they would have to do it individually. So, so you'd have to bring an application to the tribunal for the limitation period, whatever the case may be to be extended in your circumstances, but 
Well, that does matter, obviously, for us. It matters for people who get IRPs because... Any drinking and driving, 90-day driving prohibition, either an IRP or an, an uh, immediate roadside prohibition or an administrative driving prohibition. Yep. Um, or a 24-hour driving prohibition or anything yep. that you've got to file for review within that seven-day window that you've been issued. Uh, or even the 30 days for a ticket. Yep. Uh, you could apply outside of that time. That's not a tribunal. The 30 but... days for a ticket, I think, because there's the power under Section 15 of the Offense Act, would probably fall in the discretionary category. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so it's it's very interesting. Um, and the question that I have is, we don't know what the test is going to be. Like, we knew back when they used to do extensions before they unilaterally decided they didn't have the discretion to do them. There was the five-part test, right? Mm. You took reasonable and appropriate steps. You had a bona fide intention to seek review. Uh, you acted as soon as possible. When you learned of the opportunity to apply for an extension, you had an argument worthy of merit, so, you know, all those things. Um, but the case, the case that dealt with that Seegers, has always said there's discretion in special or unusual circumstances. So do the five parts apply here? Like, do you have to say, I was on my way to ICBC to dispute my 90-day RP when I coughed, and then I realized I'd been... Better not go in there. Yeah, and then I was diagnosed, and I couldn't couldn't get it disputed because I was quarantined. I had to take care of my partner. Yeah, whatever the case may my be. My business was had to be boarded up on the seventh day, and... Yeah, like I mean, where's the where's the line? Like we have no idea what the standard they're applying is. The only idea we have is a case that I had recently where a police officer who had submitted a bunch of material within 24 hours of issuing the prohibition had not sworn his report properly. And there was evidence that another officer was present with that police officer on the date of the incident. So there was an officer present to commission the oath. The officer tried to act as his own commissioner. Cute. Um, and 14 days after the day scheduled for the hearing, 14 days after the prohibition was issued, the officer sent in a supplemental report going, oops, I didn't do it correctly. Here's a fixed one. Well, the legislation says the officer has to do it within seven days. And the adjudicator said, well, I'm going to exercise my discretion to admit the properly sworn report. But they have to do it only on the application of mm -hmm. the applicant. And the applicant has to be the police officer and they have to Indeed. make the application. And then if the discretion is conferred as a result of an emergency order, isn't the power to extend the limitation period inherently, implicitly connected to the emergency? Exactly. Not, not an officer's incompetence? Exactly. And so... The only example I know of at this point of the superintendent actually exercising that discretion was not at all connected to the emergency order, was not done by way of application, and was, you know, arguably done in a way that would give rise to an apprehension of bias in favor of the police. Have you got a decision yet? Not yet. Well, it, it will be judicially reviewable, except good luck getting into court. Yeah, well, you can e-file your judicial review and you can e-file your consent order for a rehearing. And, uh, you know, if they don't consent to a rehearing, it would definitely be a case where they could be exposed to an award of costs. Because the court has said costs can be awarded against the superintendent if there's perversity in the proceedings. Well, just because we're in a state of emergency doesn't mean we should slip into totalitarianism. Well, exactly. And yet... But my that's taste just, of that's it. That's my view. <laughs> my taste of it was, you know, inching towards the totalitarian state. Well, that's ugly. It is ugly. And I'm sympathetic, and I certainly hope you're successful. Yeah, the, the even the, the even uglier part, since we're on the topic of the story, to shock our listeners. The time, shock their sensibilities. Yes, the time scheduled for the hearing was one p.m. 1 p.m. rolled around. I got no phone call from an adjudicator. Phoned road safety. Emailed road safety. No answer, no answer, no answer. Left messages. Sent emails. Got no responses. 4 p.m. that day, they faxed us the new material. And so then the hearing had, was supposed to have taken place. Was supposed to have already taken place. And they mysteriously didn't show up for the hearing. 
Wow. Isn't that, doesn't that like just seem like maybe it was an honest mistake, but doesn't it seem dirty? Well, it won't fly in BC Supreme Court. No, Actually, no. I shouldn't say that. What am I talking about? Who knows? Well, who yeah, knows? Who I don't, knows, I don't right? never, I don't predict BC Supreme Court anymore. I'm, well, the adjudicator just happened to make a very convenient mistake that benefited the police that and I... then exercised discretion without an application to excuse police incompetence that had nothing to do with the pandemic, but it's all on the up and up. Yeah. I've never seen that happen. I mean, I've seen them miss the hearing, but usually within half an hour, they realize it. Yeah. And they phone you and they're like, I'm so sorry. Can we do it now? Yep. But like when they don't answer their phone, when you call repeatedly. Yeah. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Certainly gives that impression. That would be the impression left with the reasonable person looking at the circumstances. Which is the test for a reasonable apprehension of bias. So fascinating issue with respect to limitation periods and one that I think may potentially result in some litigation when the world is back functioning again. We'll see if the world's ever back functioning again. That's true. We shall see. So there you have it. There's our podcast. And turns out it wasn't short after all, because Good. I remembered. Good. Your topic that you want to talk about. Now, if you... Driving law with Kyla Lee. Actually having Kyla Lee. Actually with Kyla Lee. And yeah. I, I said before the uh, podcast started that this is, in some respects, an anniversary episode. Because the first episode of Driving Law was on a Good Friday. Yeah. But it is not the anniversary episode. Because it's not episode 104. Well, when we can get back to more normally-ness, then. When the world is back to normal, we will do a live episode. It won't be any milestone. It'll just be a live episode. Sure. And it'll be fun. We can pretend it's the anniversary. It'll be our backdated, fun live episode, Driving Law. Bring your questions. We'll answer them live on the Driving Law podcast. And if you need to reach us to ask us any questions or because of a Driving Law issue in the meantime, you can contact us at VancouverCriminalLaw.com or give us a call. We are still answering the phones at our office, 604-685-8889. And tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law.